بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ویورز آئی ایم یور ہوسٹ ایس ایم ہالی وتھ اینڈ ایڈیشن آف ڈیفینس اینڈ ڈپلومیسی آن فیبرری ایٹ ٹوینٹی ٹویلو دی ہاؤس انویسٹیگیٹنگ سب کمیٹی آف دا یو ایس ہاؤس آف ریپرزینٹیوز فار فارین افیئرز انوائٹیڈ اے نمبر آف وٹنسز ٹو ڈسکس بلوچستان امنگس دیم ویئر کرسٹین فیئر اے جارج ٹاؤن یونیورسٹی پروفیسر Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Haidt of the Blood Borders fame, Ali Daniel and Ali Dayan and also T. Kumar among a number of luminaries. A week later, the Republican Congressman Dana Rohrbacher with Steve White and uh, Louis uh, Gumter all three mavericks, they presented a resolution on Balochistan and insisted that Balochistan must get the right of self-determination, which of course was much to the chagrin of Pakistan because it's an attack on our sovereignty and our government rightly retaliated by condemning it. But to discuss it and what should be Pakistan's stance, we are honored to have in our studio today Air Marshal Shahid Latif, former Vice Chief of Air Staff and currently a defense analyst. Welcome. We have with us Ahmed Qureshi, who is also a defense analyst of high repute and a columnist. Welcome. Air Marshal, Christine Fair, whom I mentioned, has written an article which appeared yesterday in the Foreign Policy magazine. And she not only condemns this particular resolution, but she also recalls that the members of that particular committee are also mavericks who are not looking after the interest of the U.S. or the interest of Pakistan-U.S. relations. How do you look at it? Uh, for sure, uh, to begin with, I must condemn uh, the step that has been taken. I am surely not for it. Uh, but having said that, uh, I, I would think that uh, one has to, uh, as far as Pakistan is concerned, uh, we have to do a bit of soul searching and before we start to raise noise about interferences from outside, we must see as to why we have reached a situation in which uh, the outsiders, outsiders have started to meddle uh, with our affairs and interfere so actively that first uh, a congressional uh, hearing uh, uh, was called and, and, and then uh, a resolution was tabled. Yes, whether it is uh, passed or not uh, is a matter of time and we'll have to see it. I personally feel that uh, the chances are slim. It still has to pass through the uh, House of Representatives and then the Senate. But the fact of the matter is that it's a wake-up call. And such things happen only when there are uh, weaknesses within. Uh, in that context, I would like to uh, highlight that uh, the problem of Blochistan is not new. It's been there. It's been there for decades. If you recall, the first military operation uh, was done uh, as far back as 1958, a major military operation that was launched. Uh, the second major military operation was in 1970. 73. 73, all right, 1973. Uh, the latest one has been around uh, 2005, 2005 2006 onwards, and it continues. In between, there have been three other operations because uh, as far as uh, the Baloch are concerned, uh, they know that there have been six military operations. Uh, so an area that has been subjected uh, to the use of force for so long uh, will naturally resent at some point in time because force is not the solution to political problems. Uh, I personally feel that there has been a political vacuum in Balochistan that, that wasn't filled. Uh, we didn't enter into, into a dialogue. Uh, we've been ignoring uh, that area for far too long. And ultimately, the unrest in Balochistan, and particularly, like I said, after 2005, uh, some of these people have run away, and they are the mainstream uh, leaders of Balochistan. You know, Baloch and Pashtuns uh, do not have a representation today in Balochistan because they boycotted the last elections. So they have if, run away. If, and if, if you hold that thought of solutions, okay. because I agree with you, okay. there is a problem. Yes. But the point we are trying to discuss, and Ahmed Qureshi, you pointed that out in your article yesterday, APC in Baluchistan, is that 
does it give the moral high ground to the US to condemn Pakistan? Because, you know, uh, the article I mentioned about uh, Christine Fair, she says that when she went for this hearing, she heard comments like, let's stick it into Pakistan. They have been getting after us in Afghanistan for the last 10 years. Let's fix them up. So this is not the right type of an attitude coming from a superpower. I agree with uh, the Air Marshal that we have a problem. But uh, this does not give the right to uh, any foreign country, of course, to use it to blackmail Pakistan. What's happening here is obviously a blackmail, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a question, it's not a question of human rights. It's not a question of whatever grievances th there are in Balochistan. It's a question of uh, punishing Pakistan for whatever positions, foreign policy options that we're taking here. And it's very interesting that it comes uh, just before uh, our own parliamentary re review of uh, our relations with the United States. And it's, a, it's clearly an attempt to influence that process and to sort of uh, send a message that there, are, there will be consequences if Pakistan tries to uh, not go along with the, whatever the United States has uh, in its mind for this region and for our own role in our own uh, strategic region. So I think it should be, it should, uh, we should, um, I think the Pakistani media, the Pakistani politicians, especially the politicians, should not uh, try to justify what the, what the U.S. lawmakers or the U.S. Congress did uh, by, by resorting to uh, explaining our own domestic problems. Those are our problems. We certainly need to, uh, we cannot ignore them. We need to tackle them. But we should be very clear that's a domestic issue. It cannot at any point, and, 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 and it, it really disturbs me as a Pakistani to see that many people uh, in our media indulge in uh, what I would call an apologist attitude, where uh, automatically whenever you raise this point, uh, the discussion goes on to our own mistakes, and we have plenty of those. But when we're discussing a foreign uh, a country meddling in our affairs, we should be very clear Whatever we will discuss about our own mistakes, that will be domestic. It cannot be raised at an international forum. And we should uh, draw a line, and I'm sure the Air Marshal would agree with me, that we should be very firm because if we don't show firmness at this point, I'm afraid this will be a very slippery slope. Exactly. So Air Marshal, you see the point which both of you have made, that of course the problem exists. We need to resolve it, but we don't need to be reminded, and especially, more importantly, others exploiting it, you see. Pakistan is facing this very severe problem that people are telling us from the West that Pakistan is sponsoring cross-border terrorism, Pakistan is nurturing terrorists and all that. But on the other hand, if you see our friends from Balochistan, whom I sympathize with their woes, but there are ways and means of resolving it. But they are being given asylum in Switzerland. Harissa, if, if I may interrupt, you, you just mentioned West. You know, I, I have an issue with this. Uh, I don't think anyone in the West is trying to do us any harm. There are certain lobbies in the United States, in one country. And uh, when, you, when you talk about asylum no, in Switzerland... No, the point I'm trying to ta uh, make is that they have, you know, sought asylum the West in, has Switz given in asylum. Switzerland. Yeah. They have given in, asylum. In, in, the uh, Americans did it, sir. In, the, in the, the UK. The Americans negotiated the asylum for Bram Dag Bukti in Switzerland in Geneva. Yeah, fine. They negotiate it, but yeah. right now they are there in UK and, and in Switzerland. Yes, they so are. Point yes. Is, the point is, seeking given asylum is something else. Yeah. It's on humanitarian grounds, but using or allowing your territory to be used for insurgency or such, you know, criticism of another country, that, sir, is criminal. Yes. Uh, look, I'm in 100% agreement with you uh, and my friend here that this is something wrong, outrightly wrong and it is to be condemned. Having said that, I am trying uh, to attend more to the problems that have, that have invited this kind of interference. You see, because unless your own house is in order, there will be interferences of all sorts, and we'll keep condemning. We'll keep blaming them uh, for this, and today I stand with you uh, in, in, in saying that this is none of their business to be pointing fingers at our domestic affairs. But if you clean up your house, you will eliminate the possibility of the outsiders committing aggressions on you. It is the weaknesses inside that always lead to aggression from outside. This is the point I'm trying to make. Uh, having said that, uh, look, uh, look at uh, the American uh, position and, and their uh, situation. Uh, and once again, I would, lead, uh, I would, I would point uh, uh, to, to our past history. Uh, as far back as 2005, if I recollect correctly, uh, 
the uh, American agencies, which is CIA and the National uh, Intelligence Council, put up a combined report. And uh, having been encouraged uh, by their uh, balkanization model, uh, this report indicated that they were now working on Pakistan. Of course, uh, they had their sights fixed on, uh, on uh, Middle East and on Central Asia. And so this is a part of the greater game that's going on. And that is why uh, this effort that, that you may make uh, to, to, uh, to criticize the Americans for their interference here uh, may not really pay dividends because uh, if it is a part of the greater game, the, those efforts will continue. And this is my worry, that if we are falling in that trap uh, in which they had anticipated, and this report clearly point, uh, points out, uh, that by 2015, they will make an effort to declare Pakistan as a failed state. And they have mentioned reasons for that, in which they will try and achieve fragmentation here, inter-provincial uh, uh, rivalries here, differences between the state uh, and the society. Uh, a complete breakdown of law and order. Complete breakdown, bloodshed, and see how they are happening. Didn't they happen, haven't they happened in the Middle East? Uh, you see what happened in Libya, Syria, Iraq. Not the and, and for that matter, now it is uh, coming, it has happened in Yemen and it will come to Iran, Afghanistan and Pakistan. So we see a connection, we see a chain. Those are much bigger things to worry about. And, and, and if you fall in that trap and if you pave the way uh, for, that of a, for that kind of a campaign to be run here, I, I guess you are at fault yourself. What you can do is to clean it up and then tell, uh, it will set in itself be a message to others to just lay off and, and not have a reason no, to come point, and interfere point, with your mess. Point, point taken, you see. We have to clean up our own mess. Yes. Maybe it will be like a Herculean task of cleaning the audience tables, but it needs a concerted effort. And what you pointed out in your article the other day, I would like to actually apprise uh, our viewers if they haven't read that, is that, you see, if you live in a glass house, you shouldn't throw stones. If we are talking about the USA, it has had its own past. Texas, we all know the history that the Texans were, you know, uh, the state of Texas was taken away from Mexico by force and today or t tomorrow an and MNA a gets up and says that we, we, we support the Texans for a separate state. If you or for go, that matter, the Red Indians. If you go to Geneva next month uh, yeah. to the UN Human Rights Council session next month, you will meet uh, various delegates from the United States, from specifically from the state of Alaska. And you would be stunned to know that there is a very vibrant movement for the, uh, for, for the independence of Alaska. And there is a long history of grievances, including deaths and assassinations. And you will meet U.S. citizens uh, who, who would very logically, with uh, great reason and great uh, printed material, would explain to you the legal basis of their struggle and the history of their legal interaction with the federal government in the United States on this. So they have problems. But I, I just very quickly, Hali Saab, what Air Marshall said here is very important. I'm a very unashamed advocate of, uh, of a type of reform in Pakistan that should uh, deal with exactly what the Air Marshal just mentioned. And I must uh, say here very uh, clearly that it is time that the Pakistani state stepped in, asserted itself, and introduced things that would fall into the category of indoctrination, of strengthening the Pakistani identity, of reforming the way politics is practiced in this country. We cannot afford political parties that divide Pakistanis on language. We cannot afford political parties uh, whose leaders are permanent. We cannot afford political parties that uh, directly deal with foreign governments without the knowledge of the state of Pakistan. Uh, we need to we need to limit uh, the these or, or just fill in these gaps in, in in the wall that surrounds our state. Uh, we have these weaknesses. Of course, when I mention this, of course, uh, normally people counter and say, "Well, you need to give time. It's a process." Well, we don't have time. We are entering the second decade of the 21st century. The the time for experiments was, uh, I'm sure you would agree, and the air marshal was the last century, the 20th century. Many states uh, got away with many experiments inside their borders. Uh, we don't have time for that. We wasted, uh, I think, uh, if, we, if we take the 1980s or, or begin with the, with the parliamentary elections in 1985, we've wasted almost three decades, 30 years of what I would call failed 
politics. We have a political system that is going nowhere. If you have five elections, if you have ten elections, you might have some minor improvements. But the major flaws, the structural flaws exist. It's not about civil-military relations. And I think we waste too much time on, on things that, uh, that distract us from the real thing. The real thing is very simple. We have a structure of the state that is very wrong. We have uh, federating units that are based on, 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 on language. I don't, I, don't, I don't use the word ethnicity, ethnicity, sir, because I don't believe that we have major ethnic differences here in Pakistan, but we certainly do have cultural or, or linguistic differences and so forth. You have polit politics, you have very very flawed way of practicing politics that divides the country instead of uniting. And we, unfortunately, allow rebellion, sir. I mean, that is wrong. In January 2005, uh, the late who is our elder, Nawab Akbar Bukti, an elder Pakistani statesman, resorted to a wrong option to express his grievances with the state. Uh, he accumulated a large amount of rockets, and without notice, uh, if you recall, in January 2005, he started firing rockets at the various uh, gas uh, and Sui gas uh, installations in, at Sui. And, and that was uh, the wrong way to go. And, uh, and we have uh, condoned this kind of rebellion against the state for too long, uh, there should be options. The state should also provide space, actually, for that kind of uh, expression of dissent. But right. it should not go violent. And the violence, and, and for example, people going outside Pakistan seeking support from foreign governments, like Braham Dagh Bukti, for example, did, these kind of things should be pointed out and outlawed in clear terms. Right. So, Air Marshal, actually, coming back to your point about uh, setting our own house in order, two weeks back, I had the opportunity to visit Balochistan as well as the entire Makran coast. And I came across a number of development projects. Unfortunately, why I'm saying unfortunately is that they were run by the armed forces. Unfortunately, because it is the central government, the federal government which should be doing this. And I met a lot of Baloch leaders who said that the, these development projects are too little, too late. They should have been done in 1970s, like establishing schools, hospitals, roads, dams, because we have already, you know, created a situation where these people are disgruntled and the others are, of course, playing with the fire. What do you have to say to that, sir? Look, uh, first of all, I have a difficulty with understanding that the development in a province uh, should take place under the auspices of the center. The reason is very simple. Have you done that to the other provinces? Are we saying that in the other provinces there is absolute calm, there is no law and order problem, there is no corruption, money is not pocketed by influentials? All of this is happening across the board. Uh, the entire length and breadth of the country. Mm. Why, therefore, make an exception out of Balochistan? Why did we run into military operations in Balochistan only? The problems were similar. There are Sardars and there is the Darbari system in Balochistan, but there are the feudals elsewhere in the country. Did you crack down on them the way you crack down uh, in Balochistan? This is precisely that human beings resist and they desist. That uh, you have one set of rules applying in one province or uh, in the entire country and you have a special set of rules being applied specially to one province and that is where they felt deprived, dejected and it is that destitution that has led them to feel uh, that they are not the same uh, as, they're uh, not as being treated at they are not being treated at par, there is an equitable distribution of, of resources. For instance, when was Sui gas uh, discovered uh, in, in Balochistan? I guess in the 50s? Exactly. Okay. And when was, was it given to Sui? 85. That is the kind of deprivation, inequitable distribution of resources, why the province should not be able to control their own resources. And particularly if there are some special resources with a province, why should they not be given priority? And that, royalty for that. And royalty. Yes, they have now accepted royalty. I'm told that there's about 120 billion uh, rupees and that are being dished out at the rate of 10 billion uh, rupees uh, a year uh, to the province. But it is far too less far too late. Exactly. This is what the Baloch leaders and so, these were, uh, you know, uh, temperate people yes. whom I met. So one that, why is the province being treated differently? And that is why these feelings have come in. And then uh, I agree that yes, uh, 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 Mr. Akbar Bukti should not have resorted uh, to that kind of violence and approach that he took but against the state. Talking about Mr. Akbar Bukti, sir, I, then, have, I have a point. Yes. That you see, Balochistan has been ruled in the past by its own Balochi leaders, including Mr. Akbar Bukti. Yes. Why did they not do something for sir, their own I province? To, so, sir, I, in 2005, okay. if I may just interrupt. Okay. I went to Sui, Dera Bukti, and I had the opportunity to, uh, let's say, walk the streets. 
uh, in, in Baloch attire, uh, so that nobody would notice that there's, there's somebody, an outsider here. And I was stunned, sir, uh, in 2000, this, this was 2005, and in 2003, I was in southern Iraq. And sir, if I were in your show, in fact, I should have done this, if I were to uh, show you some of the picture I took in, in Deir Bukti and Sui, and some of the pictures I took in uh, southern Iraq towns and cities like uh, Nasri, uh, Najaf, and Karbala, and uh, Bas not Basra, but the outskirts of Basra, you wouldn't uh, know which is Iraq and which is uh, Pakistan or Balochistan. Mm -hmm. uh, the underdevelopment at Dera Bukti is, is, is horrendous. And to know that the person who was in charge of that area, the late uh, Nawab Akbar Bukti, uh, for so many decades actually pocketed, as you know, huge amounts of money and did not spend a single penny on his people uh, is, 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 I think, I would say criminal. And I think why, when we talk about, uh, and I endorse what the Air Marshal just said, I completely endorse it. I have uh, no conflict with any point that, that you raised, sir. I would just simply add that when we mention this, we should also add that uh, we should also hold accountable the people who were at the helm of power and those were local Baloch politicians who did not, as you said, very clearly pointed out, that they did not uh, indulge in uh, developing the, the problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. We've yeah. even I had a prime minister from Balochistan yes. who should have you know, made sure that the resources are equitably distributed. I, I, I do not absolve them of their weaknesses, uh, uh, but I'm, what I'm trying to say is that like in the rest of the country, somehow uh, corruption has been an, an anathema all over. How did we deal with them? How did we deal with the provinces uh, that were kept backwards? Look at the rural areas in Sindh. Uh, look at, uh, were they really developed? There was uh, enough money that was being provided, but once again those feudals did not allow these areas to develop. But in Balochistan, we took a different approach. You know, six military operations in these 60, 65 years of our existence, compared to virtually none in the rest of the provinces, it does lead to discrimination. And it is here that the human beings, like I said, they resent, they revolt. And it has come to a point of revolt. And now, when that happens, should you use force? No. Force has never worked anywhere in the world. When there are insurgencies, so as we are you, trying to the end of this program, done. I would like you to just sum up and say what we as a state should do to, you know, and ensure that peace comes to this province. Okay, uh, I, I personally feel that there is a dire need uh, for a political dialogue, and a political dialogue with whom, not with the actors uh, that are on the scene today. They are not representatives. The present government uh, in, in in the in the in the province is not really representatives of the locals there. You need to have Baloch, you need to have Pashtuns, who are the main representatives of that area. Point, point taken, sir. I'm okay. afraid I've run short okay. of time now. Get them, get them, uh, you know, uh, to talk to you. And people who are really angry, who are sitting abroad, they are the people that you need to talk to, point out their problems, but at the same time, do, uh, you know, uh, elicit their cooperation uh, right. to help you. Right. But at the same time, with the outside forces, you need to have a dialogue and tell them to lay off. Right. So, viewers, with that, we come to the end of this very intense debate. Both our panelists agree that the United States, or for that matter, any outsider has no business to be meddling in the affairs of Pakistan, and Pakistan's sovereignty must be respected. But at the same time, a problem does exist in Balochistan, which must be taken head on. And we need to resort to straight away state affairs in which we make sure that the people of Balochistan's problems are allayed and it is brought back into the mainstream. I would like to thank you Air Marshal Shahid Latif and Ahmad Qureshi for your very cogent comments. Viewers keep sending us your inputs and also hope to see you next week inshallah. Allah Hafiz.